Hi guys, if you're watching this, just to kind of recap what we talked about today, or if you missed today's class, um, really what we're just trying to do is set the background for the Baroque art analysis coming up later. Please do watch the Khan Academy video that I'll post as well. Uh, it's about nine minutes long and it really gives an in-depth look at to what that, as to what that time period looks like. First thing I need you to do if you're absent is to complete seven lines. What were your big one to three issues with the LEQ? Was it timing? Was it one of the components? Was it the actual writing of it? What exactly went on there? Um, please make sure that you do that for me. I'd appreciate that. And then kind of give us some feedback and I can do that moving forward. One of the big things that you guys have talked about is uh, a need to make connections amongst some of these different things. And so what I tend to do here is just take a look at some big trends that we've seen, uh, really starting from the Renaissance and then moving our way forward from there. Uh, the first involves women, and women's roles have changed quite a bit during this time period. Initially, at least, uh, women were in charge of not just the normal child care um, and basic upkeep of the home, but also religious teaching. And that changes as we move into the Reformation, as some of these religions begin to establish standardized education of religion, uh, that responsibility is removed from the female job description within the household, basically. Um, we saw it with the Jesuits creating their universities. Uh, we saw it with um, a couple of different reformer groups in an effort to try to educate people. We also saw it with the Catholic Church after the Council of Trent, trying to standardize what exactly is taught. And so it becomes less of a familial obligation to teach religion and more of a standardized one. We also see changing roles within the aristocracy. Um, the aristocrats move from what had been a feudal construct to then using the different economic advances during this time frame. So we see the advance of the advancement of um, bookkeeping, um, banking, all of those things um, are just going to help out the, arist the aristocrats in order to consolidate their wealth. And it's less of control of the peasantry, and it's more of an understanding of economic process, the development of capitalist ideas on an individual level within Europe. Um, again, this isn't global capitalization. It's still mercantilism as a national um, economics policy but within each country or within each empire, within each locale, you're dealing with capitalistic ideas, making things in order to sell them, to gain money and to make your business grow and be better. For the peasantry in Western Europe, as I just mentioned, your role has kind of changed as well. You've moved from this peasant type of society. Now we start to see the development of individual land ownership. Um, they're not going to be willing to pay for the land Uh, wealth from there. And that ties into commerce, obviously. And we see that within the New World as well. Jamestown goes from uh, trying to simply subsist into eventually developing a thriving tobacco industry there. And then that tobacco being sold back to England uh, and other European powers as well. Um, but that development of commerce and cash crops versus subsistence farming um, as we see in the next part regarding agriculture, that's a big change from this time period as well. Moving into commercialized agriculture, farming not to eat, but farming to have an occupation, farming to make money. And so those cash crops are going to come into play. And so some of these other areas that um, are being developed, especially in the new world, uh, in India, you can throw India into this as well. It's not going to be the development of what we would think of as traditional farms, but it's going to be, okay, how can we use this land in order to make additional money for us? Is it uh, things like tobacco in the new world? Is it going to be um, the cotton in India to replace the, col the British colonies when those go away? In Eastern Europe, however, especially we're talking about Russia here, the land is so expansive and you have so many different groups there that you don't see that same um, consolidation of resources. You don't see the same development uh, towards a more capitalistic society. Uh, it tends to be much more feudal in nature, and that's going to stay the same way up through the age of exploration, 1500s into 1600s, even into the 1800s, where we have these local lords and local leaders in charge of specific tracts of land 
uh, people are paying money in order to grow crops and live on that land. That's kind of the way things stay in Russia and East Europe. In terms of the rule of law, who is in charge? Um, we see the beginning movement of absolutism. If you started to dabble within chapter 15, you'll notice that is a huge theme during this time period. Uh, these monarchs are starting to look at, okay, um, I don't want this religion to be, that's not the focal point to me, but I know that it's a way that I can try to control my population. So the religion is used to, and this is, this sounds callous, but manipulate the political landscape to ensure that there is control, to ensure that there's peace. And tying into that is also the morality of law. During this time period, we still see humiliation being used as a way to keep people under control, whether it's a stockade and people being able to walk by and look at them, throw some cabbage at them or whatever, uh, or if it's um, certain customs such as we have like Karavari uh, with a CH, and Karavari is the idea that you would follow people through the streets in order to humiliate them. Uh, it initially starts as a way to just deal with um, people getting married and people not uh, other people in the community not approving of that marriage, but then develops into kind of a pseudo crime and punishment type deal. Uh, next week, we'll get to witchcraft and see how that ties in. Uh, it's going to tie into religion as well, obviously, um, the belief systems that they have. But again, our, our goal here is to look at, okay, what are these societal connections and how do they connect to what's going on overall? So as we move from the Renaissance, we start to see the impact of Gutenberg's printing press. That means that there's more literature out there. That means more female authors can get information about the rights of women or the etiquette of women out into the rest of Europe. Um, it means that people are going to start to understand things from an educational level. Um, and say, okay, I want this to be me. I, I want to be the one to rise above my station. I want to be the one who um, owns my own land. So all of this is tied to some of those other concepts that we talked about from within these groups. Uh, the uh, so in talking about artwork here, we're going to move from Renaissance into the time period of the Reformation, and then into some different art movements for today. And again, this is really just background information. For the Renaissance, uh, we see the relationship of the artwork to the events of Europe. Catholic Church, yes, it has declined since the Black Death, but overall, we still see the really strong influence of religion on artwork. Um, we see that um, these religious leaders are also powerful political figures. Those are the ones who are the patrons who are paying for these artworks, uh, these pieces of art, who are commissioning these artists to make them. And so we have this idea that the ideas of the Renaissance are driving the way that the artwork is formed. Um, we see a relationship between perfection. When you think back to Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, it's about perfection, it's about perfect proportions, uh, alliterations aside, it's, it's really about trying to find the perfect form, the ideal form. And this goes back to ancient Greece. This goes back to ancient Rome. This goes back to uh, people talking about um, Plato, believing that the ideal form of government is a republic. All of this is tying back together. What is the classical form of these pieces of art? However, the pendulum is always going to start to swing the other way, whether it's politically, whether it is the rights of certain groups of people, or whether it's artwork. And so we see a shift from the, per the perfect, the ideal world into more of a realist nature, and that's mannerism. And so you see this is smack dab in the middle of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, 1517. And so we start to see emotions um, being expressed in artwork here. It's not about what's perfect, it's about what you feel. We start to see more of the individualist attitude. And it makes a lot of sense because people are very emotional during this time period. You have wars of religion going on between different groups and different sects in order to try and say, we deserve religious tolerance. These are the things that I am feeling. And, and that comes out in the artwork. Um, there's a need for spiritual guidance during this time period. Uh, religious tolerance is a big idea. And so what that means is, what does religion mean to you? And then therefore, what does your artwork mean to you? Uh, it's also, this time period mannerism is, is also signified by um, asymmetry. So we move from the perfect proportions, perfect lines, into starting to develop more of um, uh, lopsided, I guess, is the, the antithesis of, asymm uh, of symmetry. 
but I think you can see it here. The proportion, this is El Greco, the disrobing of Christ. Yes, he's the focal point. Religion is still the focal point, but we see kind of the proportions don't look right. Look at how large the body looms based on this robe in a court compared to the head. Uh, look at the proportion of the people standing around him. Uh, yes, you have this incredibly religious moment, but you still have this guy over here. He's kind of getting some work done in the time frame. Obviously, you can probably guess what he's actually doing. Um, we still see elements of the Renaissance. We see the background being used to try to create some depth here and the vanishing point in the background there. Another example of mannerism is The Last Supper by Tint, uh, Tintoretto. Excuse me. And um, here we're getting really stylized. You have these angels representing heaven coming down to meet Jesus with the Last Supper. Completely different look than that of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. We see here um, certain people are given this glow around them to signify their holiness. And then you have just regular people. Look at the servers over here on the side. It's more than just about uh, Jesus and the religion as the focal point. You also have this sense of realism. Um, here we have a cat or a dog, it looks like, putting its head into the basket, trying to lick the plate clean. Much more so of what is actually um, on people's minds during the century. And that is going to take us into the Baroque period. And again, this is real quick background. The video is going to do this more extensively. And, you know, quite frankly, just a little bit. Um, but it's all about realism. It's about intense emotion energy and movement, diagonals, changing lines, instability, and I know I'm just reading this, but to show you, you have here another figure of David. We've seen this a few times, but it's not Michelangelo's David where you're staring at the perfection of human form, the future king of Israel. You're not looking at Donatello's David standing in triumph on Goliath's head. You're looking at somebody who is about to throw a stone, and so you see the shifting weight. You see the taut muscles at certain areas, you see kind of the lopsidedness of the figure. It looks like it could possibly fall over. It's a little tough to see here. I think the video will do a better job, but uh, the intense look on his face, the concentration, the pursed lips showing that he's about to launch this rock. Uh, look at the flowing robes. They're not straight up and down. They are wrapped around him as he's about to uncoil and launch this stone. And so all of that is kind of going together. It's not a straight up and down line, but rather a diagonal line. Um, in terms of what he's looking at here. You can see he's coiled up and twisted on a diagonal. And the Baroque period uh, is what we're going to be analyzing tomorrow. Um, you'll be either associated with paintings and sculptures or architecture, and then uh, looking at four distinct pieces, just like we did in the Italian Renaissance and Northern Renaissance lesson, and then we'll have a Socratic seminar on Monday and Tuesday. On Monday, if you have paintings and sculptures, you'll be doing the discussing while the others will be taking notes. And on the flip side, architecture is going to do the same thing on Tuesday. Uh, so we'll be talking about that a little bit more. I'll get Michael in to think other than just the mediums of architecture. That may be possible tomorrow. If you have any questions, obviously, please email me and let me know. And have a great day.